COE, fine tweaks or major overhaul? My name is Lee Nianjo. We're here to look at the system surrounding the Certificate of Entitlement or COE. To help us get a reading of what is going on, we have six experts with us. So let's start things off with pointing out what is right or wrong about the COE system. Erin? I personally don't have a big issue with the COE system as is right now. It's based on the Victory auction mechanism that was introduced back in, in the 90s. Uh, my personal issue with the overall system actually is more on the belief that the administration has with regards to zero growth policy for the, for the COE quota itself. Now look, we have been building roads, uh, tunnels, you know, expressways and whatnot over the last you know, quite decades. Um, and population is increasing as well, right? And you have all this stable supply of COE Right? and uh, increase in population and, and more roads and stuff like that. Why is COE being held constant? I guess that to me is, is you know, a, supply and issue, a supply and demand issue that is on, at hand right now. Uh, and to make matters worse, we have COVID that just, ha just happened. And um, you know, during COVID itself, people from all over the world make Singapore home. And it makes matters worse because these people, a lot of them, tends to be inelastic to prices of vehicles itself. And as a result, COE prices. Um, and this further adds on to these issues, right? And if you look again further back in time, you have PHVs coming in um, with LCR and you know, Grab Rentals and a whole bunch of other companies that came in to buy cars and stuff and really just disrupt this balance, if you may, that we have over the last uh, 30, 40 years with the COE system. Um, this has changed the fundamental way uh, that COE is today. And as a result, you know, my biggest issue with, with the overall system Right, really is the supply and demand, and as a result, really the, the, re the question being, why um, is COE quota being held constant? And um, uh, overall, I think that is what I feel is happening with the issue today. I think that's a good point, because we don't have uh, zero growth for housing, right, do we? We don't have zero growth for human population, right? Because if we want a certain number of people here, and we intend to, say, grow the population over time, then we have to cater to a certain kind of need, like housing, like schools, hospitals. So in transportation, uh, you may say that the car is unnecessary because we have MRT, we have buses, mm. but there will still be certain journeys, certain trips that cannot be catered by buses or trains. You still need a car. So who do we assign these cars to? Right. So zero growth, I think, is a bit too draconian. I mean, we've had the COE system since 1990. Zero growth was only introduced five years ago. Is it time to review that? I think just now Aaron pointed something which is an acronym that has been thrown around a lot, which is uh, PHVs or PHCs, private hire cars. And these are usually like the two things, right? There's ride hailing services. There's also the type which is basically rental, whether it's renting on a very short term, which is now called car sharing, or the longer term ones that, you know, the, the, the types that we're familiar with when you travel overseas, you pick it up from the airport and so on. So I guess this private hire topic though has been coming up a lot. And what would you say, like maybe to the, to the panelists here is that with private hire, that also gives you transport, right? I mean, what's, how does that corrupt or affect the, this situation with COEs for cars in general? I mean, it's being used. What, 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 what do these vehicles serve as to me, I think they, they primarily they serve the role of a taxi, yes. right? So before um, these uh, vehicles came in, or this phenomenon uh, arose, we, we had something like 28,000 taxis. And already we had the highest taxi per capita population in the world. Mm. Now we have more than twice the number of vehicles or taxi-like vehicles on the road. Um, do they serve um, a, a higher demand? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And is it also desirable from a tra transportation uh, point of view? Because these vehicles, being uh, for hire, they clock a lot more kilometers, right? And then of course, emit more carbon mm. and contribute to more congestion, right? Mm. Um, as opposed to the family car where you go to a certain destination and you park. It may not be economically sensible for the owner of the car, but from a transportation point of view, mm. uh, it makes sense because you're not congesting the road uh, 16, 18 hours a day. Mm. So I think the, the ownership structure of PHCs or PHVs may actually blind us to the fact that essentially it's operating as a taxi. 
And I think this is one of the key issues behind um, the conundrum that we're, we're seeing right now. When you allow um, commercial interests go into categories A and category B, it would obviously put an additional pressure on prices. Um, back in 2012, when LTA discovered that there was unnecessary pressure from taxi companies in category A, they moved them out and actually put them into category E instead. Now, if you, if you look at that approach and that principle, it means that if you were to maintain the, the standard that Cat A and Cat B should be reserved for uh, private owners and then category E be the domain for commercial usage, I don't see it being applied right now. It's an interesting concept for us to really revisit because it's been used by LTA before. And I mean, if it walks like a duck, packs like a duck, looks like a duck, most likely it's a duck, you know. So I, I think that PHV should be treated probably the same way as taxis. Mm. So, all I mean, on category E, is this open category where you can use for all sorts of vehicles to register except motorcycles and ducks. <laughs> and then now we are raising this point of this phenomenon of the open category COE as a possible bleed or valve for the, for the demand from private hire vehicles. Is, is that kind of the idea that's floated here? I will, I will differ a little bit from... Mm these two gentlemen's views. Uh, I was in the business in 2012 and uh, that was the last time before this couple of years that COE spiked. Right? So there was a lot of blames on taxi companies, like a lot of blames are on private hires these days. right? And uh, I was dealing with quite a few taxi companies at the time, uh, very close to, to them. And when uh, finally the LTA de decided to change the system, it did not impact COE prices much. I still remember some of my taxi uh, companies, uh, friends actually called me you know, and said, look, 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 you know, you guys have been uh, blaming me and then, I mean, blaming us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, look what has been done to, uh, with, from LTA side. And actually it doesn't have much of an impact on COE prices, right? So I, I wonder if uh, LTA gave into the pressure again now and tweak the, the way private hire will consume COE, will it actually have any impact? Because after all, COE is still a supply and demand system, right? I would beg to defer because PHVs operate very differently from a taxis. Mm. And back in the day, mm. whether you like it or not, the cost of a taxi actually matters to the operators. How much you actually uh, uh, put, how much the, of the cost of the COE uh, is actually a key fundamentals to a, uh, a taxi operator in terms of applying it. Mm. PHVs are slightly different right now. I mean, they actually basically, basically go into a COE bidding situation to secure the COEs and they basically pass on the cost to, to the rental uh, applicant. Mm -hmm. And they basically have to, to, to just meet the monthly requirements that's needed for the THV uh, entitlement. So I would say that there is an additional commercial uh, interest that maybe didn't exist for taxi operators. I certainly didn't see, I mean, I was involved in, in COEs in 2010 to 2012 where they was at a record low. I don't really see them coming in so aggressively for every COE bidding mm. as I would see probably in PHBs right now. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. The players that shift COEs are the guys who are still in the game in the last 10 to 15 minutes of every COE bidding. And there are not many players in the marketplace that can still up their bids in the last 10 to 15 minutes. And whether you like it or not, car dealers have a ceiling that they can only bid up to. They are regulated by the price that they've set two weeks before the COE close, and they're also constrained by the margins that they can have allocated for COE bidding. PHVs, on the other hand, as I'm ma made to believe, is that they essentially don't really have that as a constraint. There is no real ceiling. They bid to secure COEs, because without that, they cannot put cars on the road, and without cars being on the road, they don't earn a, a dime. So I would say that the two examples are fairly similar, but there is an additional uh, commercial power to bidding for COEs now, which never existed for taxi companies back in the day. Yeah. It's also ironic that a lot of these PHVs which are secured yeah. are parked Absolutely. idle in so many car parks around the island. Absolutely. Right? Because you know, they can't find hires at the, at the, at the raised rental yeah. that a higher COE would uh, necessitate. Mm. And you have these idle vehicles parked around the island. And, and, and what happens to them? Uh, the, the thing is that they have the flexibility to switch these cars mm. into normal cars normal to be cars. sold. Mm. And, and that kind of uh, flexibility does not exist for uh, taxi operators. So now we're seeing the same, same, but different from a taxi. Yes. I mean, can we also hear from uh, any other ideas towards this concept of taxis, PHVs as transport or as part of the COE system? 
You know, I, I think um, I'm going to take a step back and suggest that we're getting a bit lost in, I think, the weeds of what to do with PHP's taxes and so on. I think there's a more fundamental issue at stake here. And that issue is that I think um, no matter how you look at it, the conclusion is, from, I think, that the pricing in the theory market doesn't really effectively reflect the real social and economic value of driving anymore. And I think the reason for that is that we have a system which is designed to clear the market prices based on short-term supply and demand. But actually what you should be aiming for is a more accurate measure of what is the long-term value of having a certain transport type in Singapore, what's the long-term value of having a certain you know, use of that vehicle in Singapore. And all these debates about you know, PHV's taxi and so on, it really gets back to this question, which is that we don't have a good way right now of deciding what is the value of assigning more quota, for example, to a taxi or PHP versus the value of assigning it to a private user. We have no good basis for making this judgment. Uh, for the same reason, we also don't have a good basis for making the judgment, why should there be so many goods vehicles? Why should there be so many motorcycles? Uh, the fact is, unfortunately, all our numbers, our quotas for these vehicles, come more or less from the vehicle stock that was in place in 1990. And even that vehicle stock number wasn't really scientifically determined or determined by any sort of research mechanism, right? So I think we need to kind of go back to the beginning and ask the question, uh, what are we trying to achieve with the COE system? But what I see, you know, today, the pricing, uh, the price volatility in particular, all of this, I think, are symptoms of a system that isn't working as well as it should, basically. So let me follow up yes, with Walter's uh, um, comment, and it connects to Chris's uh, observation earlier. What is the problem that we face with uh, private transport? We just quib quibble over how to distribute the COE quotas. I think we're missing the point. Mm -hmm. The problems are two. One is congestion, mentioned by Chris, and the other, slightly mentioned, alluded to by Chris, is emissions. That's why we, that's why we, have, we need to regulate private cars. If there were no congestion issue and no emissions issue, then I think the government would agree that there's no need for COEs. The trouble is the government's taken a very uh, draconian approach to controlling congestion and controlling emissions, which is rather than directly control congestion and con emissions, they control the number of cars. Mm. It's as if, if we took an took a, a analogy, we're worried about uh, emissions from power stations. We wouldn't limit the number of power stations. We do something about, oh, we change from coal to natural gas, we change from natural gas to solar. That's a natural solution to address the problem. Here with cars, we've come up with this very, I think the world's most unique solution, and it's just showing its problems is not very fit for purpose. And now that we have the government's invested and announced that we're going to introduce the satellite-based uh, electronic road pricing, now's the time to make the switch. Let's make that bold switch and Never mind whether this is right or wrong. Let's agree it's not fit for purpose, and let's move straight to satellite pricing, and then charge for road usage, which is a problem, and indirectly charge for emissions because the emissions are related to the road usage. Now's the time. So, you know, I, Take a big step. I'm going to agree with that, Ivan, but I think at the same time, it wouldn't absolve us, I think, of the problem of having to decide how to price different categories of road users, right? Because you could have a uniform price, but the uniform price probably wouldn't be regarded as satisfactory by a lot of people. They would say, well, you know, you should privilege one group of road users over another for the same reason that we don't have just one uniform theory category. So I think, unfortunately, we can't get away from the problem that the system inherently has some expectations the public has about different kinds of social values or users of different types of vehicles. We, we could have a very pure system where we just charge you according to how much space you take up in the road, but then you would probably end up with an outcome where a lot of people would feel that they're legitimate users of the road, which um, users which can't afford, for example, that price. That's why we have the current system where we distribute the COEs over large, small cars, motorcycles, and so on. Sure, yeah. I think we could have that conversation. Yeah about how to price for usage, but we shouldn't be getting uh, wound up in a conversation about something which is third best or fourth best mm. or fifth best, yeah, yeah. which is what is, which is now uh, dominating the airwaves and newspaper yes. uh, pages. I agree, yeah. So I think on this topic of connecting usage, I think, I mean, the, <laughs> the last time I did economics was a long time ago, but this connection of making sense of how you use and what you pay, I think it's the, it's the price of of uh, how you price things. 
And here, if we want to take maybe not so far back, but slightly closer to the action, is this whole problem of pricing. I think uh, if, I, if I interpret when every time when, we are, when, when COE results are out, everybody's complaining, it's so expensive. And then now suddenly, oh, it dropped so much. Is this volatility that, we, that, that I think has been drawing a lot of focus? Mm. PHVs, whoever it is, are just kind of like the, the you can call them scapegoat, whoever are held responsible for driving up or down this volatility. I think, I mean, what do the, especially for the, for the ex-industry people or currently in the business, What's your take on this volatility? I mean, stocks and shares, right? It's kind of fun, right? You, you, you profit, you lose. So Victor and I lived this in 2010 to 2013 when CUEs were a historic low. And I'll be honest with you, I was personally surprised that 10 years on, we still really haven't learned from that experience. Because what you had was a feast or famine sort of situation arising from a 10-year cycle. And I think this kind of feel idea, which I think uh, uh, the ministry came up with, was actually banded in the trade for a long time. We were suggesting, let's just level it off. Mm. Call it 60,000 a year and just leave it so that the trade will adjust the, the demand features accordingly. I, I was really caught off guard this time around because that same year, ten, that same 10 year cycle came along. The same pressure points that we felt back in 2010 to 2012 occurred. But guess what? This time around, there was actually a bigger demand push. From but this is on the supply side. And then right. also, early on, we talk about a bit so, of trying to grow the supply. As far as, far as I'm concerned, I think this has to be looked uh, uh, holistically. It is a demand issue as much as it is a supply issue. Yes. Just by turning on the supply tab doesn't give you a, a, um, a proper pricing of what uh, the value of uh, transportation really is in Singapore. And it now has probably descended to a point where it is really only those with the deepest pockets will be entitled to a, a transport. And I don't think that is really what uh, a lot of us um, you know, would agree to in Singapore. Mm. The other thing is coming back to Prof's point about you know, taking a bold step and, 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 uh, and transforming now since we're at this crossroad. Everyone's unhappy with the system. Let's transform now. I, I actually overheard this at a grassroots discussion where someone actually suggested that we should make significant changes. And, and the feedback given uh, by, by the person there was that COEs, I only get scolded once every 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have very high ERP pricing every single day, I get scolded every day. So this is really, it boils down to political will to do the right thing. And I think that has to be defined by all of us because there's a lot of vested interest in this discussion. What is really important is what is actually important for the growth of Singapore and, and how do we allocate it. Look, it's called a certificate of entitlement for a reason. It's already on the label. So I think for all of us to actually try and you know, uh, shoehorn in social equity elements into this thing is noble, but there will always be losers in this discussion. And we just need to make sure that as much ground is covered so that as little people lose as possible and as much people gain as possible. Yeah, no, it's, yep. it's a really noble idea, but I think you know, that's, that's probably what we're trying to achieve, I guess. Yeah, no, um, from my end, I, I feel that volatility gives rise to speculations. Mm -hmm. right? and, and for us, honestly, as, as a company, we sell mostly used cars, right? But you would imagine that COE has pretty much a positive impact for us if it goes up. But the honest truth is that actually it's more volatility. So when volatility goes up, actually lesser people buy used cars. And for that matter, lesser people sell used cars, mm -hmm. right? And, and again, the same for, for new cars itself. So for us, honestly, as an as a online car platform, we really wish that the, the COE prices itself is less volatile. Now, whether it's up or high or low or whatever or not, we are, we are less concerned that way. But honestly, the volatility is not good for anybody, new car dealers, used car dealers alike. Uh, and, and for us, the thing that I feel needs to be curbed really is this whole mindset of speculation and gambling, right? From that standpoint, because actually there's a lot of uh, dealers out there that actually speculates onto COEs, right? With open cats and stuff like that. And this is also another whole open can of, I mean, a whole can of worms that needs to be addressed as well, right? Speculations that results in, you know, uh, unwanted activities where people with, I guess, correct proprietary knowledge is actually making money uh, from the system without actually benefiting the system. I think that itself is an issue. Volatility, I mean, my, my take on volatility, right? Because of all these volatilities, people claim that the COE system is a broken system. I differ in my view, okay? I think if, to, to, to really trace back the root of this whole COE volatility, 
we have actually got to go back to the early noughties, right? Uh, for some reason at the time, the way LTA determines how much CV quota you get is based on a forecast system, which is completely different from now, which is based on actual deregistration, right? So for a good period, that was like 2000, 2001, for a good period of quite a few years, okay, uh, the forecast was too high. So they have been issuing too many COE for a good four to five years. Uh, the industry was, of course, enjoying themselves right at the time, uh, or enjoy ourselves at the time, right? Uh, but then we paid a price because uh, that con continues for some years. In fact, it reached a record number. I, I believe until today, it still stands as a record number of 110,000 pieces of COE in 2005, okay? Then LTA realized something was wrong because the car population on the road was growing too fast. So about, I, I think around 2009 or 2010, they decided that no, 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 we're going to change the entire system. We're going to be based on actual deregistration instead of forecast and you will, you will not go wrong. But the problem at that time was because a lot of the cars were still very new. Cars on the road were still very new. So nobody was deregistering. And suddenly it led to a big dip in COE quota and a huge rise in COE prices, okay? And it was actually from these two uh, period of time that it creates the feast and famine we always talk about. Uh, okay? I, I don't think the system itself is broken. All right? uh, it's a demand supply system. Okay? Supply will be based on the number of cars you want on the road. Uh, there will be all sorts of social costs and economic costs to go into calculation how many prices, um, how, how many cars you should have on the road. Uh, demand, of course, can never be totally uh, Confirm, you know, it will uh, flu fluctuate. If we have this conversation a, a few months ago, uh, I will have a very different view. Uh, but with what the government is doing now of this cut and fill, okay, I think it's the right way to do. To do. It, it, it's the right way to go. Because actually, even in the last downturn in 2012, uh, when a couple of us met up with LTA, even back then, uh, we suggested somewhat like a cut and fill system already. Take from future quota and put it here. Uh, but for various reasons, they didn't want to do it. And even as early, as recent as September last year, uh, we suggested the same thing. 10 years down the road, we still say cut and fill. Uh, I think credit to LTA. Uh, not long after that, they decided that, okay, let's try it once. But the first time they tried this cut and fill, uh, if you remember, their stand was that this is a one-off. It's a one-off, all right? And I think uh, 6,000 pieces is a one-off. And uh, series prices show that it wasn't enough. But the recent stand from the authorities is that, nope, it's not a one-off. We are determined to do it until COE prices comes down to a reasonable level. But obviously, nobody's going to say what's a reasonable level. It's too sensitive. So if they continue along this line of a determined cut and fill system till COE prices stabilize at a reasonable level, I think we're along the, the right track. You know, I, I think the underlying problem here is that you have a fixed 10-year duration for the COE. That naturally, I think, as you pointed out, it creates this problem where whatever mistakes or changes you make to the system today, mm -hmm. they perpetuate themselves pretty yeah. much 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to cut and fill, I think we're all in agreement that this is something that should have been done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I think we can also see that any policymaker will be very cautious about taking the more extreme approach to cut and fill, which is to try to really seriously even it out across the years. Mm -hmm. And there's a very simple political reason for that. It's because today, lots of people complain about COE prices. Not that many are actually buying a car mm -hmm. and facing that high price. But when they come to the bumper years, right, in the next couple of years, when people who own mass market cars are going to be deregistering them and buying a car, they will be expecting COE prices to be at the level which is consistent with a very large COE supply. So if you were to take their COE from that period and redistribute them to now, all of a sudden, they're going to find that the prices are not as low as they thought they would be. And then you have a different political problem. And so I think mm -hmm. the only way to address, and policymakers know this, which is why they're not very aggressive with cut and fill. Mm -hmm. So I think the only way to address this is really to go back and think about, do we even need this fixed 10-year thing in the first place? Should there be a system which is more flexible and still accurately, I think, reflects the cost of driving, right? The congestion costs and so on. So. Right. <clears throat> a question <clears throat> on this. Uh, cut and fill before we get to the, the this fixed tenure or flexible tenure is when you bring COEs that are going to expire further uh, uh, in the future to use now does that still keep your vehicle quota system your 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 zero percent population growth I mean 
bear in mind, we're only talking about cars. You know, commercial vehicles, you get a little bit. Motorcycles, sorry, not in this conversation today. But just keep topping up now. And we talk about 10-year life, lifespan, right? right? Every additional COE that comes in now, or rather you bring them prematurely, doesn't that effectively increase the number of, of uh, vehicles on road? And then there we are, we actually have some growth. Uh, is that a correct reading? Uh, I, I think it was made very clear in the parliament recently that yes, uh, this cut and fuel will lead to short-term increase in the car population. Yes. But you will even out. Yeah. When yeah. it comes to short term, we're talking about five, mm. half so, the COE life. Eh. Cut, cut and fuel is a, is a gradual process of trying to achieve that flattening mm. of the curve. Mm. Right? Between um, you know, uh, 20, uh, 2015 and uh, 2021, there were about 100,000 five-year COE renewals. That means these five-year renewals, they have to be scrapped. Yes. They cannot be extended further. So they, they, they have the leeway of bringing these 100,000 COEs earlier into the market than later. So this is the lever that they are pulling mm. now, mm. Uh, which I think, you know, I think it's uh, better late than never. I, mm. it's, it is shown to be working. Mm. Hopefully they continue and then bring all this out and, and, and flatten the curve once and for all. Again, we shouldn't fall into this trap to think that the supply of COE is the solution to congestion. I think once we fall into that trap, we seem to think that so long as we limit the number of COEs or number of cars on the road, congestion will go away. Actually, that's... Exactly. I mean... Uh, it's, not, it's not accurate at all. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got to understand that current kind of failure, just a, 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 a response to what has been you know, a pretty difficult management of the COE system. But let us not go ahead, I mean, on Prof's uh, theory, right? Let us not go ahead assuming that this should persist, you know what I mean? I mean, the, the dream scenario is everyone in Singapore can afford a car, but it'd be really painful to drive one, yeah. you know? So I think that, that seems to me uh, uh, something that a car light society should aim for. Uh, and, and I think it boils down to the fact that the the situation in Singapore now, if you apply Hong Kong's example, right? It's cheap to buy a car in Hong Kong relatively, but it's incredibly difficult to actually use it because parking charges and so forth. So we may have to really look at other alternatives and see whether, the, again, the political will can be applied to make sure that we actually find some um, middle ground for us to achieve what we want to achieve as a nation in like 10 years, 15 years from now. So I think now is a good time when people are very unhappy with the COE system. <laughs> the body politic must be better ready to make a change. Um, and I think the government should act boldly and take this opportunity to make the change. Yeah, exactly now that the ERP2 system yeah. is ready, and uh, all they have to do is to flip the switch and mm. go into distance charging. Yeah. Because the political will doesn't seem to be present or mm. strong enough. I agree with that. In fact, if you look historically at the reasons the government gave when they were introducing ERP, when they were expanding ERP in the past, they were very clear that with better use of uh, electronic road pricing, they could actually see a way to let more Singaporeans own cars because mm -hmm. the problem, the congestion cost of car ownership could be controlled much more effectively through road pricing rather than just through upfront charges. So this was given as a justification for ERP many years ago, but for some reason, and perhaps the political reason we were discussing earlier, that people blame the government every single day when they drive through a gantry, right? Maybe for that reason, that's why it's been difficult for them to move further. But I agree completely. I mean, since we're already unhappy with uh, COE, why not say, look, let's just relook everything and accept that the alternative might be more uh, efficient from an economic perspective and also maybe not be that much more painful from the psychological perspective either. Yeah. But if we get kind of like, I, I, I want to explore a little bit more on this. After you move and then we kind of uh, close to leveling, you know, we do the little touch-ups, right? Uh, getting there. This idea of what goes beyond then, I mean, a little bit on a uh, variable lifespan of a COE, is, it sounds like one of the ideas here, uh, using other levers like, uh, like distance-based charging. So, I mean, can we maybe just touch a little bit more on how we flesh this out beyond when, you know, after Utopia, what happens? Close. And I think you have to decide, like uh, Professor Sarah suggested earlier about what is the number of category of cars and what number each category should, we should have here 
because the world has changed, right? From 1990, when we introduced COE, um, the 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 population mix of vehicles here was very different, and it was fit to purpose back then, and it it, it does not seem to reflect that today, right? E-commerce, for instance, has just come out of nowhere, and now if you are on the road, you will see that there are lots of trucks, lots of bikes uh, making deliveries. Um, do we want that kind of uh, mix? Do we want that kind of economy? Um, and, and, and if you answer those hard questions, then you, you fix the, the machine or the tool that addresses those issues, not the other way around, right? Because now we are talking about COE. COE is just a mechanism. Yes. In the larger picture, in the, uh, in the scheme of things, it's mm. really mm. transportation in Singapore. Mm. Small island, compact island, um, very scarce uh, land scarcity. So what's the most efficient way of, of moving people around? Of course, mass transit. You know, we recognize mass transit buses mm. are efficient. Um, but there has to be some, the, uh, the parts of the, the last mile and the first mile journeys cannot be catered by these two uh, tr uh, transit systems, mm. you cannot, mm. right? So you need to have bikes, you need to have cars, and scooters, and vans. So what kind of mix do we want out there? So let me take up this point. Uh, uh, Queening mentioned um, the politicians worry about being uh, cursed every day. I think that is a very, it may be outdated thinking. I remember I heard this th 30 years ago, yeah. but there's a big change since 30 years ago. We now, have, I think at that time, we, we had just one MRT line, but now we have so many. So I think if you let people own a car, but you make it more expensive to use, they're going to be happy in a different way. They'll be happy to own a car, yeah. um, they enjoy that, that they have the option. But now the alternative, if, if I can go out and use the MRT, why? The, the choice is now too, too, too wrong, too one-sided. I've spent a ton of money on the car, and then I pay almost nothing to use it, um, especially if I have a fuel-efficient car or an EV. Um, so of course I use the car. Um, but if we say that we're going to price usage properly, then the MRT is going to look a lot more attractive. And we have such nice MRTs now. I don't know if you, I just recently took the Thompson East Coast line. And it was just amazing, just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but so long as it for me, if I, I think of this selfishly and rational, economically rationally, I'll say it cost me what, 50, maybe a dollar to drive to SGH, that's where I went. Um, then of course I'll just drive there and the parking is maybe another five bucks. But if you say, okay, it's going to cost you 10 bucks, then I'll, I'll start thinking about the Thomson East Coast line. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I'm interested to know about this behavior, right, on uh, utilization still. I think, I, I think we have, uh, well, not publicly accessible, but vaguely we get an get, get a indication on the use of vehicles. You know, we have lifespan, age of vehicles, at what year they get scrapped, the kind of kilometers that they clocked. So I remember, I think this was probably an article that Chris did actually reporting on this, that he saw a trend that as COE is going up, utilization went up. Because the mentality seems to be, I'm spending buckets on this, I'm going to you know, work it. So is it almost to say that a high COE price, sorry to obsess on that, actually uh, uh, makes it worse in terms of uh, congestion? The very point that COE is expensive, I'm going to use it more. Use it more means the roads will get more congested. Prof Peng, you actually wrote something about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, ago, uh, years ago, I did a piece of research with uh, one of our motor uh, companies, which very kindly gave us the data on uh, maintenance records on cars. Mm. And we, we actually studied this period. Victor mm. mentioned uh, when COEs were low uh, in the 2008 and 2010, yeah. yeah. and then they rose up very yeah. sharply in yeah. 2012. Um, mm. uh, and we found that the people who bought the cars when COEs were low used their cars less than those people who bought their cars when COEs were high. And we interpret this as a, uh, a psychological effect. I spent so much money on this thing, oh, I should use it. I've never been in a situation in a showroom, and Aaron and Victor will probably agree to this, 
when someone comes into the showroom not determined to drive the car every single day of his or her ownership cycle, I, I, I just feel that high COE prices really uh, justifies me wanting to maximize my purchase. And obviously, if, it, if it's to meet familial needs and duties, all power to you. That's great. But I think very often, if you look on the cars on the road these days, it's one driver. Yeah. Very few. Uh, yeah. Because there's, there's really no uh, usage measures that deters you from Absolutely. driving the car, right? Practically nothing. Uh, parking is abundant in Singapore. Um, roads are, you know, uh, a little patchy these days, but good network, but 9,000 lane, uh, kilometers lane of roads. Mm -hmm. So well connected. Um, so the, where's the usage deterrent? There's none, practically, for someone who spent $200,000 on a car. Mm -hmm which is what will cost you today to buy an ordinary yeah. family car, right? So if we go with the hindrance, the friction, to use a, you know, it sounds tech here, but if the problem now, or rather it sounds like utilisation doesn't, doesn't hurt so much, we've always, I mean, again, this is very short-term reactionary to, to reaction to, to the current situation is, are people then getting into these vehicles? Yes, the purchase price is very high, but do we have any knowledge or insights into how do they actually afford these vehicles. I, for one, don't have 150000 on under my pillow. And this is just like one, one point of, of price, but prices are high. You know, cars are being sold, they're being registered. I mean, do we have know anything about this? How are these people getting into these vehicles, these expensive vehicles? Um, Aaron, do you have anything? I mean, they definitely have to borrow, right? I mean, uh Statistically, on our, on our end, about 70-80% of our customers, when they buy a car, 7 in, eight, seven in 10, or 8 in 10 of them actually tend to take a loan. Right? I think it's probably the same, similar for, for, for new car dealers as well. Um, so I think a lot of it is really driven by that. And, if, and for us specifically, because we are not exactly a bank, right? so we play in a very different category of, of uh, MBF, MBFCs, non-bank finance companies, um, our customers tend to be a uh, different profile. Right, all together itself. And, and for most of them, they tend to be actually um, uh, customers that are you know, on PHVs, for instance, right? uh, or buying it for business usage, uh, usage and stuff like that. Uh, and the truth is that a lot of them are buying it under PHVs uh, for, for various reasons, right? because in, uh, under, the, under the current uh, scheme, uh, effectively, if you, are, if you are buying for personal use, you can only borrow up to 50, 60%, depending on the category of the, of the COE. Right, itself, I mean, or, or the value of the car. Yeah, the of the car. Yeah. Um, so as a result, uh, a lot of cars, and we increasingly seeing a lot more of them are, are categorizing themselves as PHV cars, right? So that they can mm. get off that category. And if you are under a business in that sense, you can actually borrow up to 90, 100% uh, LTV in that sense. Um, so, so things like this allows uh, for, for customers to actually borrow and, and, and uh, pay in installments, mm, uh, the yes. vehicles that is like, you know, really expensive. But to be very honest, we are, we are again not very big fans of it, right? So internally, we, we underwrite quite a bit of, of finances uh, every month. Mm. Uh, it's in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, let's just say that I'm not a big fan of uh, high COE prices, right? Because for me, at the end of the day, the, the consumer's ability or the customer's ability to pay back is the most important thing for me running as a, as yeah. a, as a loan lending business. And it is not good for me at all if COE prices are high. And if the person, you know, push comes to shove, the PHV driver can't pay because mm. the, the installment of the car, car is prohibitively high. Uh, and I, I was very clear internally, and I, I wrote a memo to my team internally, I think last month, uh, when the COE prices was really high, I told them to categorically stop looking at uh, financing uh, very high COEs. Right, we should wait for this to pass and true enough, mm. that happened. Yeah. So I think the stats actually back that uh, evidence, there's, you know, back the evidence. Because um, between uh, January and, and September this year, um, companies and private hire vehicles, either self-drive or chauffeured, uh, they made up 37% of registrations, which I, I think you can safely say means 37% of mm. COE secured. Mm. Uh, that's nearly two in five, right, mm -hmm. uh, vehicles. And, and, and that kind of backs up your, your observation that a lot of these uh, buyers are going on the, the PHV route mm. uh, or corporate route to secure more financing so as to enable them to have access uh, to a car. And, and over the years, you, you, between uh, 2019 and 2022, just very quite recently, uh, the number of these cars have actually risen quite a bit. Whereas on the other hand, 
private, the, the private ownership of cars actually went down between this, this period. So here actually it's an interesting thing that may not be talked about so much is that it seems that the data that suggests that private hire cars are growing, they're not really, really private hire cars. At the end of the day, is if I to take your point, is, is access to financing, access to getting that vehicle. So for all intents and purposes, it is a private car. I'm just paying it like a private hire. It, it goes back to my contention that we need to take advantage of the current problem that we have with those COEs to actually look at this, not purely from the supply side, but also from the demand side. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you this, the issue on financing has always been one of the, the, the instigator, the fuel for driving up demand. And for the longest time, even though we have fairly um, strict financing requirements, mm -hmm. the trade has always found a way to circumvent some of these financing requirements. Mm -hmm. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you don't give, say, an overtrade for a car, that person may not have the necessary down, the pay, uh, down payments to actually get into another car. But lo and behold, PHV has actually opened up another dimension to driving up demand. And that is where I always feel that if we keep talking about supply, we're missing the picture. The demand side, the, the, what drives demand, cheap financing or easy financing is also one of the things. Mm. And I think if you were to go back in time, in 2013, um, early 2013, when COE prices were breaching 92,000 thereabouts, um, the government actually stepped in to actually curtail loan quantums or rather increase deposit requirements for CAF. COE plunged dramatically from January all the way down to April. And that is something that even a global financial crisis never achieved. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is if you curtail demand or find ways to actually neuter uh, easy access to demand, mm -hmm. you may actually have take away some of the pressure from the system and then really be able to have a more rational discussion on this topic. So on that, actually, if you think about it and taking Aaron's point as well, putting it together, even companies or institutions who are in the business of financing also do not want this risk of volatility, people defaulting, oh, yeah. not to mention the political cost that comes with all the social ramification. If people's cars are getting towed back, it's a bad look for anybody, right? I think this is the, this is the part where we kind of like it or not, where we started with a back looking at the weeds again, is PSCs, is private hire cars, or at least as we interpret it, it's more like the definition of private hire cars, right? We're not the private hire cars that we started with, the villain, but this is just regular folks getting financing. Oh, and, and, and because these, these um, buyers tend to go in, uh, get, get access to a car at a higher cost, mm. because a 100% loan is gonna cost you more. Yeah, then, yeah. then a sixty percent loan. Yeah. That's why you see the, the, the interest rates mm -hmm. going to be different. The repayment is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And and what do they do to make up for this higher cost? A lot of them just do casual trips. Uh, casual, uh, what do you call uh, for higher trips? Mm -hmm. It means uh, like a side uh, hustle. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, like a taxi, yeah. right? And um, th that will result in more road usage, more congestion, yeah. more emission. Mm -hmm. So do do we want that kind of mix? Once again, going back to what I said earlier about, you know, is it more desirable to have a population of cars that are traditionally privately owned mm. than making that few trips? And then the cost is on really all on the owner. Or to have a growing and, and unhindered expansion of this new breed of cars, which are, you know, in all intent and purpose, for private usage, but on the other hand, because they have to make up the economic uh, uh, premium mm. of owning such a car, they, they make these trips. Mm. They make these for higher trips and, and they clock more miles. Mm. What, wh what do we want? Yeah, no, I just want to add on to Chris, mm. right, in the sense that uh, what we see at, at externally and what we're very afraid of is people masquerading as a PhD driver, but actually they are a private driver, yep. right? Uh, and that's something that and as, a, as a business itself, we, we, don't, we don't encourage and we do not encourage for sure. Um, and statistically, we have seen exactly what Chris said. And some of them uh, you know, are drivers, for instance, like bus drivers. They work for you know, one of the yeah. card and ministries even, right? And then on a part-time, they do this grab driving sales stuff. I and mean, we see a lot of profiles like this uh, as a, as a multi-finance business. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I love this whole ability to get access to food. As when it's called grab food and stuff like that, it's, it's great. 
right? Uh, so I don't want to make it sound like we are, at least not, I'm not bashing the whole PHP system. I think that there are merits to the, to the business, there are merits for their existence and stuff like that, and all this food delivery stuff is, is great and it actually enhances the life of all of us. Uh, and, um, you know, overall, as is right now, I feel that the, the, the whole issue we have on hand is, is more than just PHP categories itself, right? It's really more, uh, I still feel that the supply is constant and the demand is very, very high, don't know to say this point. Uh, it's more, PHV is one, right? there's a whole, whole, um, there's so, so multitudes of factors, it's not just PHVs, you know? there's also immigrants, right, you know, there are also people more affluent, there are businesses, there are, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I, I think besides <laughs> PHV as the boogeyman and also yes. uh, financing, right, mm -hmm. uh, we must not for, we must also remember, between new car and used car, there is this ecosystem going, that feeds off each other, okay, let's say COA price high, okay, somebody want to buy a car, I cannot afford a new car, I go and buy a used car, right, and multiply this guy by many, many times, used car prices will go up, right, it will go up. And when used, price, used car prices goes up, people can fetch more for the used car. They can afford more on their new car. Mm. <clears throat> you see, so it feeds on each other, uh, and your affordability, your, your, your affordability issues actually goes away somewhat when it feeds off each other. As in, if it was trending up. Yeah, if it's trending up, anyway, it's okay because I fetch more on my used car, yeah. so I can afford to pay higher for my new car COE. Yeah, so there is this ecosystem going on that feeds off each other, right? Uh, Victor is absolutely right. You know, internally, what we see is that the the, when, okay, when CO prices goes up, right, uh, you would think that car prices goes up, it's true. But when CO prices tanks, our used car prices doesn't really tank. The used car dealers, they tend to, yeah. they tend to just hold it there a little bit, right? Because the cost is very, very different, right? So just back up yeah, uh, whatever yeah. Victor just said. Until it's totally true. Until at some point they cannot, because CO just keeps tanking yeah. and they cut they loss. Have no <laughs> That's why yeah. But typically, it, there is no knee-jerk reaction, right? When, when CO tanks, I can assure you, yeah. statistically, at least from what I see, right, it's like less than a 5% adjustment. It's really behaving point. like petrol prices, right, at the pumps. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I mean, actually now, I, I hate to be the party pooper, but, you know, we actually got quite a lot of points going on. I mean, for, for, for us to actually distill it into, you know, parting shots, right? What really are those things that you think need, needs to be changed? Is it like, I mean, we, we, we entitled this, is it a minor tweak? or major overhaul. Feels, I, I'm getting a bit mixed here. I mean, we've got some really good, con I mean, all the concerns are there. I think now I want to go around the, the, the panel here and says, what is it? Can we label this as, if it's an overhaul, what is it you must, must, must do? Or just tiny tweaks that you think we, 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 that, will, that will push things over to, to the next uh, stage that it can be. So I'll take a shot at it. Okay. I, I love where Prof Walter is going uh, with like taking a real good look at what is the um, spread of um, vehicles and the amount that is really needed to ensure that we go into, uh, into a, a transport system that befits our status as, a, as a, a leading light in this area. You know? I think that's one thing. But I think beyond that also, this fixation with a fixed number of vehicles on the road needs to be really looked at because again, it's not the number of vehicles that's the issue, it's actually its usage. I think that from the supply side needs to be met. My biggest pet project is, say it, say it. is to look closely at what drives demand. Mm. Because when you have limits of supply of anything, the price eventually is driven by demand. And if you don't cap demand or find a way to neuter it, then you will always have a, a, a situation where COE prices... I mean, I can't believe that we actually think 100k COE is actually reasonable. I, I come from a school of thought where it is not, you know, it is really, really high. And uh, my, my recent trip to Australia, the taxi driver asked me why a car so expensive in Singapore, and I calculated a Toyota Cross Corolla costs 564% more in Singapore than it does in Australia. 564%. Now, of course, you say, oh, wait, they're Australia, big land. But honestly, dollar for dollar, I think it's a bit ridiculous for us to be spending so much on cars. We have to find that, that point. If you don't look at demand, I think you will never be able to to get to a point where this is fairly reasonable. And there are so many demand factors, I would love to go into it. I don't think we have enough time for this, but we really need to look at it very carefully. Yeah. Any other, who's, who's next? 
I mean, look, I, I'm in favor of, I think, just reviewing the entire system. But I think the core of that review really has to be looking at the balance that we have between COE and ERP, basically, or other usage-based control. So I think I'm in agreement with a lot of the people on this panel uh, that basically throwing everything, more or less today, into the upfront cost is not the best idea. Mm -hmm. Now that technology has actually matured to the point where alternative methods of control are possible on a daily basis and usage basis, we ought to look at that more. Uh, I think everything else is just details, but I think the aim of the review, right, besides taking care of the details, is to reduce the frictions you might say in the market. Because right now, there are all these uh, oddities, I would say, about the market that really tend to make the system unstable. They tend to make the system volatile, and we should get away from that as fast as possible. I mean, in my ideal scenario, you would have a system where it might not be cheap to drive a car in Singapore. I don't think it ever will be cheap because of our constraints. But at least the price will be somewhat predictable, and it won't change a huge amount on a month-to-month or year-to-year basis. It will change reflecting underlying supply and demand for you using vehicles in Singapore, but it won't be dramatic. And I think that will be better for everybody. I'm in agreement with Walter. Uh, I feel that now is a very good time. Uh, people are unhappy with the COE. Uh, it's dominating discussion. Uh, we have a superb MRT system, which is even still expanding. And the government's launching ERP too. They should really seize the opportunity. This is the moment to make a big reform and then put us with, put us into a private transport system that will carry us forth for the next couple of decades. So I'm hearing another big revamp, right? Mm. No, I agree. We, we really? need to look at uh, the usage side of things and, and do something about that. Right. Because uh, right now it's a total imbalance. So much weight has been put on the ownership acquisition part of it mm. and very little on the actual usage yeah. because the actual usage is actually the thing that causes congestion, which is what the COE system is trying to tackle in the first place. In the first place, sorry. So then, I mean, going forward, uh, if we actually go distance charging for ERP, there is no guarantee that COE prices will drop if we do not control or do not have an idea of how many people we want in Singapore, right? If let's say, for instance, the population doubles, then we will come back to $150,000 COE, or maybe even $300,000 COE. Yeah. Still on. Yeah. Now, for me, the, the first principles that uh, applies, right? We need to backstop for the problem in that sense. And for, for me, an, an ideal uh, COE system has to have three things, right? And you know, being a Singaporean, we love acronym. I would say VAS in that sense. Initially, volatility needs to be good. It shouldn't be vo too volatile, right? It should be accessible, accessible for the general public. I would say that, you know, uh, the current way of distribution is not exactly the best way of doing things. And um, the, the last one is being asked right by itself, and, uh, and that really is uh, speculation. I, I still feel that at the end of the day, we should make sure that the system um, doesn't encourage speculation, right? And also, at the end of the day, people should not be profiting from uh, loopholes in the system. I think that's the, the, the VAS, I would say. Right. It comes back a little bit on volatility and also the access, that, uh, yeah. the access part of yeah. it. And speculation, yeah. Well, for me, going back to your keyword of whether the system needs an overhaul or just tweaks, uh, I will go for tweaks because, uh, yeah, there are certain things I agree with Chris. Uh, we need to actually look at the growth rate again because if population grow, your vehicle, your, if people pop, uh, population grow, vehicle population should grow accordingly. And uh, I also agree that we should look at charging more for usage instead. But I don't think I would define this as a major overhaul of the entire system. I am still believer of that. COE is supply demand. It's an open bidding system. Uh, as an economist, you know, just let demand supply sort itself out. Uh, but there are things you do need to tweak at the side. So generally, mm. Victor, sorry, we actually have a, a, a strong call for a revamp, whether it's in, the, in the, almost the spirit of COE itself with all the other levers, as well as addressing the, the things that have, whether it's unintended or unexpected, uh, consequences because of the situation now. Uh, I think if I, if I can kind of like summarize what we've learned to, so far in this discussion is, frankly, this is a great time to do something about it, mm. right? Because nobody's happy anyway. <laughs> and then there are all these great ideas with just even the, the, the knowledge here, there are really like seedlings that can be explored a little bit further. Mm. And I, I mean, uh, I, I, I do have this um, hope, right? Optimism, right? That we can't get worse, right? We have to do something, 
Right. I think uh, I really appreciate everybody's time for for this uh, discussion, and uh, let's hope that uh, yeah, whoever needs to listen to this can start thinking about it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.